Many Catholics today wonder about the future of the church. One of the main reasons is the shortage of priests in many areas. Will young men continue to listen to the Holy Spirit and answer the call to the priesthood? We're joined today by seminarian Brad Doyle, who's going to tell us his story of vocation and how young men today are called to serve. Welcome to our program, Call to Serve. We're joined today by seminarian Brad Doyle, a young man who has answered the call and has entered the seminary training for the priesthood. We want to ask him today about how he ended up here and how he heard the call of God in his life. Welcome, Brad. Would you please share with us today the story of how you ended up where you are now and how God brought you to this place? Definitely. Thank you. First of all, I just want to thank you, Father Matthew, for having me um, on the show. I think it's great um, just hearing all the different stories, all the different diversity in our diocese of, of men um, answering the call to um, the priesthood, to religious life, um, and at least to, to discern. You know, so uh, myself, I am 25 years old. I grew up Catholic my whole life. I went to St. George Middle School right over off of Segan Lane. Mm -hmm. And, you know, was like a normal Catholic kid. Went to, went to Mass on Sundays, um, you know, went to grade schools, had religion class, um, played football, um, loved sports, um, eventually loved music, got into music. But I think... I had um, something similar to a lot of people experience where the faith can be just in your head mm -hmm. um, instead of making it down into your heart. Um, I, I got really good grades in religion class, um, but I always like to quote uh, Walker Percy, you can get uh, great A's, uh, I mean, you can get straight A's, but flunk at life. <laughs> and so like, I, I, I might've had like awesome grades in religion, but it never really reached my heart. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, you know, I was pursuing things that, that regular high, sc high schoolers pursue by the time I got into high school. Um, you know, sports, um, girls, um, God wasn't on the top of my list. Mm -hmm. I'll just say that. And, and I had this, uh, something happened to me. I, my, in between my freshman year and sophomore year of, of football, I had, uh, had to have back surgery. Um, I got injured and uh, had back surgery and I missed my sophomore year of football. And it kind of put things in perspective for me. I started thinking about, you know, what is, what is life about? What is, what is going to make me happy? What is going to bring me joy? Um, I realized very quickly that this, this thing that I loved, which is awesome, football, mm -hmm. um, which will come up later in my story, but um, it's so fleeting. You know, I'm not, I'm not that good. I mean, I was okay. Um, probably not going to play in college. And then what... What is my passion? What's my love going to be about? Um, and it was at that time, um, uh, Ms. Baines, she was the campus minister at, at St. Michael's, she asked me to join campus ministry, and she asked me to go to this camp um, called the Fellowship of Christian Athletes Camp that summer in between my sophomore year and my junior year of high school at St. Michael. And I went, and it was there that this, this man, uh, Paul Mintz, this non-denominational preacher, um, it was kind of a non-denominational camp, cut me to the heart with how he preached, um, presented the gospel to me and, and Jesus Christ and a relationship with Jesus mm -hmm. in a way that, that I never had allowed to enter my heart. I'm sure there have been many priests, many religion, religion teachers, many people in my life over to that point who had spoken that truth to mm -hmm. me about the necessity of um, completely giving myself to God everything, my whole life, all my decisions, all my conversations, all my actions, all my desires and passions. Um, but his words just cut. And, and it was at that moment where I, I decided I was going to, I was going to, uh, you know, try this out, this relationship with God, like actually pray, mm -hmm. not just like a rote prayer, or this prayer that I wasn't, I was just saying words, but actually from my heart, pray. 
Um, and after that, really, during that summer, I was trying to figure out, am I going to be Catholic? I mean, am I going to, I went to this Fellowship of Christian Athletes um, camp, it was non-denominational, am, am I going to be Catholic? Am I going to be Protestant? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And um, another friend of mine uh, asked me to go on to a, a Steubenville conference, youth conference. Um, you hear a, a lot of that. Um, and a lot of young young seminarian stories that these conferences are, are very big um, in our lives and effective and um, it was there that I saw 6,000 uh, youth high school Catholic youth like on fire and I'd never seen that before like actually caring about the faith caring about Jesus Christ caring about the sacraments mm -hmm. and um, and it was on a Saturday night and there, it was the beginning of adoration um, bishop Sam Jacobs, um, who's a bishop of Homa Thibodeau yes. right now, he came out with a monstrance, which is just that golden receptacle that holds the Blessed Sacrament, um, Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And I, I didn't, at this point, I'd grown up Catholic. I received communion. I don't know if I'd ever went to adoration. Mm -hmm. I've ever adored the Eucharist as if it is, it is truly Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and as soon as the Eucharist walked into the room, like I knew, with every ounce of my being, with every fiber um, of my being, I was, I looked at the Eucharist and I said, that's God. Mm -hmm. And that changes everything. I've certainly heard testimonies before where people have said, when Catholics treat the Eucharist like it's Jesus, mm. people can come to faith mm. in Jesus. Exactly. Because you saw these young people in their devotion, treating it like it is what we say it is. Exactly, Father. And then that obviously had the effect on you. I'm glad that their witness was there for you so that you could be a part of that, that great moment with the Eucharist. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. It was, it was, it was a combination of, of just the reality of being in the presence of the Eucharist, but also seeing other kids and other adults treat the Eucharist like it's God. Mm -hmm. It's right, lex, lex orendi, lex credendi. How we pray that's is, right. is how we believe. And I saw them pray, and I was like, whoa, that's what I believe. Um, so it, changes every, it changed everything. And from that point on, I was like, okay, I'm going to be the best Catholic I can be. You know, I was going all out, um, kind of sold out, and uh, just, just lived my junior and senior year just trying to completely find out what the Lord wanted for me. Um, you know, I dated uh, a girl. I had a... a great friends that supported me and she supported me even in that discernment and, um, and at the end of my senior year I was really faced with this situation where um, there was a stirring in me in my heart every time the bishop Bishop Munch um, spoke about vocations it, it was kind of like that Paul Mint situation it, it, it pierced my heart mm -hmm. um, every time someone spoke about vocations I saw myself um, fulfilling that every time um, I realized, and just recently I was praying about this, that in high school, every time I heard some truth about the Catholic faith, about Jesus Christ, about the sacraments, the only thing I wanted to do is tell somebody about it. Mm -hmm. The only thing I wanted to do is profess this to someone else, draw someone else into this reality. And I realized that my heart, and what, looking back at it now, I realized it's because my heart was, was made to expand and draw people in. Um, and I think that's a big part of my vocation now, especially the celibacy aspect of it, that my heart's not made for one person. My heart's not made for, for one woman. Um, my heart's made for the bride, the church, you know, um, Christ's bride. And, and to It also sounds like you might have a gift of evangelization, that one of the spiritual gifts that St. Paul talks about is that real ability, that real desire and passion to spread the gospel, to not only minister to the people who come to church, but to go get the people who don't. Mm. And so it sounds like in, in your ministry, there's going to be a clear evangelical element to it, that you're not going to be satisfied with simply caring for those who come to church, but obviously making a proclamation to those who need to hear it. Yeah, Father, that's a great point. The new evangelization, the call for the new evangelization from our Holy Fathers, our, our past and present Holy Father, um, it's big, and I think it, for me, looking back at my vocation story, um, looking back, back at um, my development and looking at my future, I see the Eucharist as central to that, mm -hmm. um, that it was central to me and adoration, realizing 
I have to change my life. I have to conform myself to Jesus Christ because I had this encounter. And in the future as a priest, I think my ministry is going to be about just bringing people and helping them have an encounter with Jesus Christ, a true encounter. With his body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. Exactly. What a wonderful vision and what a wonderful ministry. Uh, we're just going to pause here for a little bit and we'll be right back with our seminarian in just a few minutes. Hi, this is Deacon Jody Moscona. Join me for Catholic Life, ordinary people with extraordinary faith. These are your friends, your neighbors, members of your parish, and of course, the shakers and movers of Baton Rouge. That's Catholic Life, ordinary people with extraordinary faith. St. Aloysius Parish in Baton Rouge was founded in 1955, its territory carved from St. Agnes and Sacred Heart Parishes. The original 625 Catholic families met for Sunday Masses at South Downs Elementary School until their first church, a contemporary glass and brick structure, was completed less than a year later. An elementary school was founded and enrollment quickly increased. The Daughters of Jesus arrived in 1957 to staff the school. Although the daughters no longer work in the parish, their imprint of spirituality and service remains in the hearts of parishioners. The current church was constructed in 1996. Its 850 plus seats are arranged so the entire assembly gathers around the altar in close proximity. A Jubilee 2000 gate and a crepe myrtle alley provide entrance to the church grounds from the street. This beautiful millennium gate invites all to St. Aloysius for worship, education, and social outreach. Between this special gate and the church is the bell tower, a modern structure under which people walk to approach the church. The repeating cross motif of the metal tower is reminiscent of the communion of saints and the ringing of the bells themselves serves as frequent reminder of the presence of this special community. 14-inch bronze outdoor stations of the cross, tastefully backed with wood and mounted on columns, allow for prayer and reflection along a crepe myrtle shaded walkway. Inside the church, a mahogany and West African hardwood altar designed by Patrick Ricard exhibits clean lines and contributes to the open feel of the space. The wood and brass tabernacle, though modern in form, bears a Latin inscription which serves as a historical reminder that the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. The tremendous abstract stained glass windows incorporate more than 130 colors and were designed by Paul Dufour and Sam Corso. The beautiful baptistry is carved from Florida coquina stone. Large, colorful, iconic images of the saints, painted by Milo Puiz in 1956, originals of the old church, appear on the upper walls surrounding the assembly. The Stations of the Cross, mosaics also designed by Milo Puiz for the original church, depict iconic forms accented with gold and wood. A Frank Hayden cruciform sculpture is located in the Founders Foundation Garden just outside the church. St. Aloysius remains a unique faith community in the Diocese of Baton Rouge. Do you need a little light in your life? Tune in to the next episode of Beacons of Light, where we'll share the story of the Society of St. Vincent de Paul in action, serving God's poor and homeless. We'll share stories of our volunteers and our supporters making the gospel come to life for those in need.
Where is the digital continent? Every week, Catholic Underground TV takes you on a journey regarding topics of Catholic faith in a digital world. Join hosts Father Chris Decker and Father Ryan Humphreys as they explore media and Catholicity, the faith and technology, the truth in the church's newest mission field. Join this lively roundtable discussion along with other weekly guests. It's informative. It's fun. It's Catholic Underground TV, reaching the digital continent each week on Catholic Life Television. Welcome back to Call to Serve. We're here with seminarian Brad Doyle, and he's sharing with us the amazing story of how he had a passion for things that could be taken away, like football, and now his passion has grown to something that can never be taken, his relationship with Jesus. He was just sharing with us how, as a young man, the, the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist drew him into a deeper relationship, and we want to find out how he got from there to where he is now in his seminary training. So Brad, once you had this amazing experience with the Lord in the Eucharist and he became more real for you, how did that lead you then closer to where you are now discerning the priesthood in seminary formation? Yeah, well, like we left off, I, I decided um, that I was going to um, just kind of try seminary you know, as a, as a senior in high school, I decided I couldn't figure out where to go to college. I was accepted to Franciscan University, accepted to Spring Hill and Mobile, and, and I just couldn't make a decision I, in discernment. I just said, you know what, I'm going to neither, and I'm going to seminary. <laughs> um, and so I applied to seminary. I think me and uh, Deacon Josh, now Deacon Josh Johnson, we entered together. I think we're the latest uh, seminarians that Bishop Munch ever accepted. He said he'd never accept any later applications because <laughs> we kind of, you know, um, gave him a few gray hairs. Um, and we went to St. Ben's, which is on the North Shore, uh, uh, Covington, on the North Shore of the Pontchartrain. Um, it's a Benedictine Abbey. It's actually, its actual name is St. Joseph Seminary College and Abbey, but short for, St. Ben's is short for St. Benedict, who's their uh, founder and, and patron. And there, I, I, we just studied philosophy. Um, we prayed with monks, we had some silence, we had a bunch of woods, we built big bonfires and grew beards and, and kind of grew up, you know, and that was our college experience, which I think is a lot different than a lot of guys' college experience, um, but I, I learned how to be a man there, you know, I grew up and um, learned how to think, how to, um, how to reason, how to use my intellect God's given me um, to kind of, to kind of, um, Help me before I studied theology, and that's really the church's progression. You know, you study philosophy so you can so you can have the language to even approach theology. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went to to Notre Dame for one year in New Orleans to study uh, theology, and and I studied for one year, and, and I was at I was in prayer on my five day silent retreat, my canonical retreat. We do one every year, and. In there, I was studying, or I was reading about the Jesuits' formation, and something was very attractive. Not being a Jesuit, <laughs> I don't want to be a Jesuit. I don't want to be a Dawson priest. Um, but something about their formation was really attractive, and that's their ability to to teach for one or two years, or however many years they teach. Um, and I really felt called to that, and so I discerned it with my spiritual director. I discerned it with um, the bishop, with the vocation director at the time, Father Matt Matt Lorraine. And, and we decided it was a good thing for me. And I think one of the things that um, I really wanted from this and what God wanted to give me was the ability to express the faith that I've received. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's one thing, which is learning philosophy. There's one thing, learning theology, learning the truths of the faith. And then there's another in, in giving that. You know, expressing that. And so I decided I wanted to learn how to express these truths and draw people into these truths to the hardest uh, possible, um, you know, demographic. Mm -hmm. High school sophomores. <laughs> you know, <they're laughs> so I taught, uh, I taught one year as a pastor year as a seminarian at St. Michael High School. Um, so I have my shirt mm -hmm. on. And uh, I'm going I'm to 
alumnus of St. Michael as well, so it was amazing. I played football there, so I got to coach football as well. Mm -hmm. Another one of the passions that's kind of, and I said that I was going to come back, mm -hmm. right? My, my grandfather at the time was um, just passing away mm -hmm. of cancer, and, and he was a football coach for 48 years um, in New Orleans at Archbishop Rummel High School. And it was this weird, very providential time of him passing away, me getting an opportunity to coach, um, which is kind of something, coach football, which is something big in my family, but also having the opportunity to teach, primarily to teach um, scripture and world history. Mm -hmm. and, and, they, and they taught me, really, what it means to effectively express the truths of the faith. It's interesting because, of course, the popes, in talking about the new evangelization, while it is the responsibility of all Catholics to spread the faith, they said that priests have to learn how to communicate the faith and to be leaders. Mm -hmm. And in coaching and in teaching, you're letting these gifts manifest and really be honed in you so that in your priesthood you can be a leader of men, and that you can also be someone who can express the faith. Exactly. And so as a new evangelizer in this time, it sounds like your priesthood is really being formed in you so that that vocation can be lived in such a powerful way in your ministry in the future. Yeah, Father, I mean, that's a great point. I, um, I always say that I learned uh, more about how to express the things I learned in seminary in that one year than I did all the years in seminary. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it really is a kind of a, a, a throwback or a shout out to the Second Vatican Council. You know, um, John the 23rd and Paul the 6th, um, John the 23rd called the Second Vatican Council, Paul the 6th uh, finished it because John the 23rd passed away. And, and one of the, the main thrusts of the council was to know the signs of the times, right? To know the world, know the human person and in knowing the human person, we know how the human person is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. To present Jesus as the fulfillment of every human person, every human situation, every human desire. That's what the Second Vatican Council was about, and that's what I was learning that year. I, know, I knew the theology, I knew the philosophy, but how are, how are real people, real kids, who have their own joys, their own struggles, their own uh, you know, struggles in, in the family, different situations, different struggles with sin, real people. They're not just, you know, answers on a Scantron. They're not just hypothetical people anymore in, in your textbook at seminary. They're real. They're in front of you, mm -hmm. and they have a soul, and, and Christ wants to love them, and that's where I learned that, you know. And, um, and it's, I think it's going to be important for my, for my priesthood, mm -hmm. um, God willing, that to kind of really, I, I have this desire to really implement in the fullest extent the Second Vatican Council, mm -hmm. which, which is really the, the new evangelization, mm -hmm. as, as we've been talking about that. Um, that, you know, we, uh, John the 23rd said, you know, throw open the doors of the church. Well, it can be seen two different ways. Either that's throw open the doors of the church to let the world in, or it's throw open the doors of the church so that Jesus Christ can go into the world. The gospel comes out. Exactly. exactly. The gospel comes out That's to inform right. the world. So it's not just blessing the people in the church. It's going from the church to the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, you, you love teaching mm -hmm. and you love expressing those faiths, but God's calling you to be a priest. Mm -hmm. Why not just a teacher? What is it about the call to the priesthood mm. that gives you that extra level to go as far as you're going through all the seminary and formation and not just stop at teaching. What is it that you feel God is calling you to do in addition? That's a good point. I think that um, it's the difference between just instilling information on somebody, like into their intellect or having them agree logically with something or, and, then, and then presenting that encounter. Mm -hmm. right? And teachers can do that to an extent, um, but I definitely did realize that there was, there was times where I was limited as a teacher. Mm -hmm. right? I, went, I went home, and my kids went home as well. That's right. They went home to their families which were, who, were formed, who were forming them. I only had them for 50 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. I could tell them whatever I want. I could tell them the greatest truths um, of their human situation and, and, and Christianity and Christ, how it's going to fulfillment. But if they went home, 
like that's where they're being formed. Mm -hmm. And I realized that in a sense, I want to be a teacher of families mm -hmm. as a pastor. Like I want to form the family and teach the family because that's where kids are formed is in the family, not primarily at school. Um, so that's I think that's a difference, you know, um, kind of building up the culture of family and life. It's also the example as well. You know, the life of the priest speaks in the way in a way that a teacher who might see teaching as a job, mm -hmm. you know, the priest has to be a constant witness and wherever he is. Exactly. And so I'm, I'm very happy to hear about your your zeal for this kind of evangelization. We, we really do need young priests who have this, this real zeal as a redemptorist. I have to say, St. Alphonsus wanted us to be evangelists first and foremost, and to see young priests who are really excited about that. But also just really to see your openness as you're in your formation. Obviously, things have changed in your life. You know, you've seen some of the, the obstacles be torn down, and you've allowed that, that road to be smooth mm -hmm. in your life because the Spirit is, is doing these great changes. Yeah. And so I really appreciate the humility that you bring to that because that makes us instruments then that the Holy Spirit can form. Mm -hmm. And so rather than just looking at priesthood as a sort of box that we have to fit into, you're finding your gifts and the ways that your priesthood is going to be most alive and most dynamic no matter what other men's priesthood might look like. Mm -hmm. And thank God that your formation is, is helping you to find that because it's very important that a priest finds that fulfillment and that young men who are striving for the priesthood are able to discern those gifts and the ways that will be fulfilling for them. Yeah. Well, Brad, you've given us a lot to think about uh, in this particular uh, program, and we really do want to thank you for sharing your testimony with us. I hope that a lot of the young people who've been watching today are really inspired by the passion that you brought, the, the great love that you have for Jesus and for the Eucharist, that they too can find Jesus in their lives and a relationship with Him that's alive and dynamic, and that families too will find ways to encourage their young people so yeah. that they'll listen to God and maybe answer to His call as well. So thank you for sharing that with us, and thank you for all of you who are watching. Please remember to pray for your seminarians, pray for those who minister in this diocese, and pray for all the young people that they might listen to the Holy Spirit and know that they are called to serve.